We see God inviting his estranged children to be emancipated, not only to relieve the oppression, but to meet them in the wilderness to worship him. I want you to understand that they had not had a conversation with God for 400 years. The whole purpose of the saga of Exodus is built around the birth of the Old Testament church. So anytime something is born, something has to die. Moses has come to emancipate them from 400 years of, of, of being contorted into whatever Egypt wanted. And anytime you contort who you are into what other people want, there comes a point where you become unfamiliar with who you really are. We are in transition. The world is changing. We are in transition spiritually. But God will remove anything and anyone who is standing in between us being reconciled to him. They've lost everything. They have left Egypt to rediscover themselves by reconnecting with God. I asked God to deliver me from this bondage. And now when God sends a deliverer, I'm fighting him tooth and nail and asking him, are there no graves in Egypt? But you got one foot in Egypt and you got one foot on the promises of God. Break this mindset where you want to die in Egypt in disease, in disgrace, in mediocrity, in depression. Just because you ran into trouble in front of you, you're going to want to go back to what God just brought you out of? I'm starting to see that the prophets from 2,000 years ago are prophesying a day that we are seeing today. You might want to stay in Egypt, but I don't. You might want to be buried in Egypt, but I don't. You might think your story ends as a slave, but I don't. You might think that you were just created to serve somebody else, but I don't. All God wants is to be reconciled with you. Can I go deeper? Can you say amen? Stand to your feet as we go to the Word of God, the book of Exodus, chapter 14. Uh, I think I wrote down nine, but it starts at verse 10. Uh, Exodus 14, 10 through 14. Uh, our series, I'm on a series, I'm teaching worship in the wilderness. And I'm after something. It, I, it, everything that I'm after is in conjunction with the purpose statement that I gave you during our uh, 27th anniversary. One of the things that the elements that the Lord assigned to me was to make sure that you have an encounter with God and not just an encounter with church. It is easy to mistake an encounter with church with an encounter with God. While I love the church, I'm not sure that the church, being in the church's presence is going to do for you what being in God's presence will do for you. And, and when we think about it, the scripture talks about that the kingdom is like children sitting in the marketplace, piping to one another singing to one another, looking for reactions from each other, but all the, everything else is going up on this level and we're sitting on this level. The world is in disarray. I mean serious disarray. I, I mean more serious than anything I have seen in the 66 years of my life. There are things that are in disarray that can be corrected by men who choose to ignore it for greed, for self-aggrandizement. 
and those things are reprehensible and disgusting. But there are some things that are in disarray that are in nature. The earth is scorching. It's, it's biblical, by the way. It's prophetic, by the way. But that doesn't help it from being uncomfortable. I know it's prophetic. I know it's the last days. But that doesn't help homeless people from burning up on sidewalks. And while we banter back and forth about it, we are living in some chaotic times. And I am challenged to the Holy Spirit to make sure that you have an encounter with God because everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that those things that cannot be shaken may remain. So when I say worship in the wilderness, it is dichotomous. The whole notion of the series, worship in the wilderness, wilderness, a place where you're lost a place where you're neither quite here nor there, God says, worship me right there in a confusing place, in a tumultuous place, in a chaotic place. He says, that's where I want you to pitch your tent and worship me right there. I'm not going to put my tent in your promised land. I'm going to put my tent in the middle of your problems because I want you to worship me in the wilderness. So we started teaching last Sunday, are there no graves in Egypt? In other words, the people were trying to escape slavery. They were going, leaving Egypt saying, are there no graves in Egypt? The moment they tried to break away, now Pharaoh was chasing them. Fear made them want to go back into Egypt. And, and to die in Egypt was no more glamorous than to die in the wilderness. Don't we ask our stupid questions? Aren't there no graves in Egypt? Why can't we die in Egypt? Dead is dead. If I'm going to talk to God about something, I want to talk to God about something. I, can, can, can we move past choosing where we die? Watch this. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. This is a bunch of people don't don't see this like you saw the movie this is this is 600 chosen chariots this is Egypt is the superpower of the era the Pharaoh is known for his power and his authority and his ability if he said die you die if he said live you live if he said behead her she was beheaded if he has absolute rule there is no Congress there is no legislature there is no Supreme Court there is no uh, defense attorneys there are no prosecuting attorneys there is no recourse there is no boycott there is no picketing he is absolute monarchy in complete control so they were afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord who they had not talked to for 400 years and it's not just because they're derelict faith erodes when you don't teach your children these are the children of Abraham they started out on a solid foundation but over 400 years of mixing more with the Egyptians than they did with each other their faith had deteriorated to the point their language had deteriorated their culture had deteriorated their self esteem had deteriorated to the point that they had not had a relationship with God for 400 years and God was intent on bringing them into relationship with him like he is with you God is intent on bringing you into relationship with him. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Those are my two choices. Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Leave us alone in our chaos. Leave us alone in our poverty. Leave us alone in our shame. Leave us alone in our disgrace. Don't bother me. I like being corrupt. I like being perverted. I like being broken. Leave us alone. That's what the world is saying to the church today. Leave us alone. Leave us alone. We like it like this. Don't raise any opposing opinion. Go along with us. Let 
let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. Leave me in my bondage. Leave me committing suicide. Leave me hating myself. Leave me slitting my wrist. Leave me needing more therapy, more and more therapy, taking more and more pills, pills to go to bed, pills to get up in the morning, pills to get a smile on my face. Leave us alone. That's what they're saying to the church right now. Just shut up and go along with the program. Leave us alone. Don't say nothing about anything or anybody. Go with the flow. You got to follow the culture. No, the culture's got to follow the Christ. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. How? And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. In other words, your, your emotions are talking. If you let your emotions talk, it will, it will destroy you. It will kill your marriage. It will kill your children. It will kill your promotion. It will kill your advancement. All you got to do is let your emotions get the mic and it will tear down everything God is trying to do in your life. I'm already preaching. I'm just reading the scripture. He says, do not be afraid. Stand still. Stand still. You're too busy. Stand still. You talk too much. Stand still. You got too much opinion. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, they're not in your future. They're in your present, but they're not in your future. They're in your past, but they're not in your future. I'm preaching already. I don't know what's in your present and in your past that God says, I'm going to totally annihilate it out of your future. You shall see again no more for ever the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace stop calling people stop finagling stop manipulating stop trying to dominate and control everybody the Lord will fight for you and you will study to be quiet to shut up Get your emotions away from the mic and shut up. Stop screaming. Stop popping your neck. Stop going off on people. It ain't working. Well, I'm just like your, my, my mama. It didn't work for her. I'm just like my daddy. It didn't work for him. Still faith. Quiet faith. Faith is not always loud. It's resolute. It's not always rambunctious. It doesn't always sport muscles. It's quiet power. It's still our eyes. So what I'm going to talk to you today is my second deposit on, on the series Worship in the Wilderness. I want you to look at somebody and you're going to give them the title, announce my title to them, say, we will not, will not die, here. die here. That's our decision. That's our affirmation. That's our declaration. Tell them again, we will not die here. Not die here. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your presence and your glory and your grace. We thank you for all things worked after the counsel of your own will. We thank you that our emotions are not necessarily our reality and how we feel about it doesn't make it so. We thank you that as people of faith, we are learning to walk in the truth of your word and to believe what you said over how we feel about any particular given moment. We seek your face. We crave you. We long for you. We need you like a junkie needs a fix. We need 
you like a flower needs a raindrop. We need you like an ocean needs water. We need you like tear ducts need salt. Father, in the name of Jesus, we cannot exist without you as a deer panteth at the water brook. So pant I after thee, O oh God. Feed us until we want no more. I rebuke every spirit of fear that has plagued us, that's made us wrestling and tormented us and kept away our sleep and made us miserable in our own bodies and made us forget that we are healthy and made us forget that we are mobile and made us forget that we had a roof over our head because we we're so afraid by the threatening sound of what could be, what might be, what's coming up behind us. I rebuke the spirit of death and suicide and agony and pain and strife and I command you to let God's people go. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. On your way down to your seat, say, we will not die here. Now I want to preface this because I want you to under know, I want you to understand something about God. I want to, can I teach you some things about God? God is eternal. Eternity transcends time. So we are creatures of time, hence we have birth dates, because time determines our awareness. God is pre-existent of time. That's why in the book of Genesis, it says in the beginning, God. See, there, it doesn't tell you the beginning of God. <laughs> because God has no beginning and he has no ending. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So, so I want you to understand that so that you can understand that time limits your perspective. I think differently at this age than I did 10 years ago. I think differently, I think differently at 50 than I did at 40. I think differently at 40 than I did at 20 because time allows me to increase in experience and ability and understanding. So it's not good to make permanent decisions with temporary information. I'm gonna say that again for the people in the back. Some of you are making permanent decisions with temporary information. How you feel about it now may not be how you feel about it in 20 years. Look at the people who got tattoos. I love you so much I want to write your name on my chest. Now you can't stand her. You have seen her in five years. You dating somebody else, got married to him, and got a baby shit, her, her name. Now you're trying to get somebody to burn her name. <laughs> Permanent decisions over temporary situations. When I went to school, Pluto was a planet. It was nine planets and Pluto was the last one. Then I picked up the paper one day, they decided it wasn't a planet. We don't know everything. Your doctor doesn't know everything. Your pastor doesn't know everything. Your mama doesn't know everything. Your daddy doesn't know everything. And you don't know. So God has an eternal plan that works itself out in time. Why am I starting there? Because I want you to understand that God is not making this thing up as he goes. He's not saying, oh my God, Pharaoh's coming. What are we going to do? Lord God, I didn't know Pharaoh was going to come. God knew the end from the beginning. In fact, God had prophesied to Abram that this was going to happen before Moses' mama got pregnant. God had already planned their escape before they ever went into Egypt. He told Abram that your people are going to sojourn in Egypt for 400 years and afterwards they're going to come out with great substance and Moses wasn't even born yet. 
Jacob wasn't even born yet. Joseph wasn't even born yet. God had the future figured out before the characters ever came on the stage. And there you are thinking that you are conspiring with God to plan the future. Your future was already planned before you got here. It was already set in motion. And you might be shocked at what happened, but God is not shocked at what's going on in your life. God already knows everything that's going to happen in your life. And he made a way of escape before you ever ran into the problem. So when God gets ready to bring you out, no devil, no witch, no hex, no soothsayer, no weakness, no dumb decision you made can stop the hand of God. So stand still. If God started it, God is going to finish it. And he's planning we know for sure he's planning at least 400 years in advance. <laughs> at the very minimum of this text, we know that God is thinking 400 years ahead. And you don't even know what you're going to wear to work tomorrow. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, because the book of Revelation says that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, God thinks all the way, millenniums ahead. He is sovereign, sovereign reigns. He is absolute. There is no one above him. He is God all by himself. He said, I looked for someone to swear by that was greater than myself and finding no one greater than myself, I had to swear by myself because ain't nobody better than me. Ain't nobody better than me. Ain't nobody greater than me. Ain't nobody stronger than me. Ain't nobody smarter than me. Your artificial intelligence is just that. Artificial intelligence. I am absolute intelligence. I am the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-wise God. So play with your toys and play with your games. And ask them all the questions you want, but I'm the one with the answer. And I want you to have an experience with me. So I determined that Moses would be born. And I determined that Moses, whose name means drawn out, would be born a Hebrew by a Hebrew slave. And I determined that in spite of Pharaoh, who was supposed to be the absolute power, that Moses would not see death. So he escaped. He beat the odds. I want to talk to some people for just a second in this room whose mama had a story about your birth. If your mama had a story about your birth and you know you were a miracle baby, stand up on your feet then you ought to understand the power of this text. You're looking at a miracle. Your birth was a miracle. Your start was a miracle. If you started out, you didn't have no Bible. You didn't have no prayer life. You didn't speak in tongues, and yet God let you be here today. If God protected you before you had a mouth, how much more ought God to be able to protect you right now? Who am I talking to? I want to see some miracle babies. I want to see some babies that escaped crib death. I want to see some babies that should have been a stillborn. I want to see some babies that the doctors were shocked that you made it. But when God wills you to be into existence, you are here. You ought to shout the place down. You are here. You are here. Whether you got a car or not, whether you got a house or not, whether you got a boyfriend or not, whether you got a wife or not, whether your kids like you or not, your breath is a miracle. Your Let me stop. It's too early for me to go off. I feel like going off right there. All the miracle babies touch somebody and say, don't make me go off. I'm a miracle baby. You ought to get a t-shirt and wear it and say, I'm a miracle baby. I don't care if you're 103 years old, you ought to wear the t-shirt and say, I'm a miracle baby. I'm a miracle. My life started as a miracle. I got here by a miracle. God willed me to be here. So ain't no need in you rolling your eyes and hating me because you're rolling your eyes ain't going to make me go back. If I came through and survived all of that, ain't no way you can kill me with a tweet. The devil is a lie. I'm a miracle baby. Moses was a miracle baby. I got to hear it. Moses was a miracle baby because God purposed him to be. He purposed him to be. 
He purposed him to be born in the house that he was born in, to the mother he was born to, at the time he was born, in the situation he was born, in the middle of chaos and confusion. God purposed his mother to hide him for three months in a tent a slave woman, a little raggedy hut. How do you hide a baby in a hut from a trained, experienced soldier? But when God gets ready to hide you, he'll hide you. He'll hide your greatness. He'll hide your anointing. He'll hide your gift. He'll hide your talent. Sometimes God didn't mean for you to be exposed. He didn't mean for you to get the job. He didn't mean for them to recognize you. Had they recognized you, they would have killed you. So stop crying about who didn't recognize your gift. God hid your gift to protect protect you. So God puts him uh, in the ark and lets him float down the Nile. You know the story. And, and he lands in the arms of Pharaoh's daughter. And he's raised in the house of his enemies. Because for what God is going to do in his life, he cannot think like a slave. You see, the liberation of the Hebrews, they went in a family, but they came out a nation. So Moses is designed to, to lead a nation. And if you are called to lead a nation, you have to hang around with people who lead nations. Because you can't think like somebody who's running a fast food restaurant and run a nation. So Moses got to be in the room with national thought, with leadership skills, where decisions were made, not obeyed, made. He was born and obeyed. He was raised and made. There are little clues that happen in your life, all your life, that give you glimpses of where you are to be in life. Because God doesn't make it up as he goes. He planned it from the beginning. So he's already making deposits on your destiny while you're trying to figure out who you are and where you are. This is a fight between nations. Like Russia and Ukraine. It's a fight between nations. It's not just a fight between slaves and masters. It's a fight between nations. The Hebrews left Egypt as a nation. Yes, sir. And Pharaoh was intimidated by them because they were a nation, but they thought like slaves. Well. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when we start talking about this text today, God has got spared no expense in their liberation. I want this to sink in. Now I'm getting into where I want to be. Uh, God has spared no expense on their liberation. He, 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 he doesn't use nuclear war. He doesn't use the techniques of our times, but he uses unique devices to cause them to prevail. First he says to Moses, go down there and tell Pharaoh that I said, let my people go. But before you go tell him, practice in the wilderness. Oh, gosh. I don't have time. I can't do this, Lord. I can't do this. <clears throat> my mother used to walk up on me in the basement of my house preaching. Wasn't nobody down there. I just walked around like, you can't tell me that the God I serve. And she come down the steps and look at me like, I'm like who are you talking to? <laughs> Nothing, mama. God's got somebody practicing for what you're going to do in life. Don't hate rehearsal and love performance because Performance without rehearsal will always lead to failure. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So Moses is out in the wilderness practicing his stuff before nobody. Nobody's out there. Nobody cares. Moses is in the middle of the wilderness. Nobody's looking at him. Nobody's clapping for him. Nothing. 
He's just sticking his hand in his clothes and coming out with leprosy. He's sticking it back in and it's coming out whole. Pouring out water, it's turning into blood. And he's just going through his stuff, throwing down his rod, it turns into a snake, doing stupid stuff. Makes no sense, because Moses is in time. And when you're looking at your situation in time, it makes no sense. But from eternity, it looks like rehearsal. It looks like preparatory school. It looks like I'm getting ready to do something amazing in your life and I want you to have the confidence in your craft so that I can bring you before great men and you won't faint on the stage. So I, one, Moses goes down there with Aaron who he didn't need, but he thought he needed because you can be great and still be insecure. God, I'm preaching so good this morning. You, you can be great and still be insecure. You can be strong and mighty and still doubt yourself. You can perform miracles and st 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 still st 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 stutter. And sometimes people see your greatness, but they don't see, see your stutter. And, and I'm glad that God is not just a God of my greatness, but also the God of my weakness. He's not just a God of my victory, he's the God of my failure. He's not just a God of my mountain, he's the God of my valley. And I can be just as honest with him when my stick turns into a snake as I can when, I, my, when my speaking turns into a stutter. I can bring both things before him at the same time because one does not contradict the other. All things are open before him with whom we have to do. All things. And just because you stutter doesn't mean God won't use you. And just because you made a mistake doesn't mean God doesn't have a plan for your life. And just because you're going through a bad time right now doesn't mean that you don't have a great ending. And just because you went backwards don't mean you won't go forward. And just because you're in a down setting moment doesn't mean you're not about to stand up on your feet like you never stood in your life before. I'm talking to somebody and I don't know who it is. And if you're watching online and you know somebody who needs to hear this, text them right quick and tell them to log on right now because God has given me a message that they cannot afford to miss. You're frustrated because you're not getting paid. This is practice. We don't pay you for practice. We pay you for a performance. That's when practice pays off is in the moment of performance. So don't despise the day of small beginnings. I preached in the woods, I preached in the shower, I preached in the basement, I preached to animals, I preached to crickets, I preached to roaches before God gave me people. Don't despise the day of small beginning. You don't get paid in the practice, you get paid for the performance. My first business deal was to take uh, walnut hulls and boil them and turn it into dye and sell it in mason jars for, for a quarter. I was eight. I know they didn't need that purple dye. They just bought it because it was nice. And then mama grew greens in the garden. I sold them in brown paper bags for a dollar, from a quarter to a dollar, and gave a receipt. And I gave a receipt, they were talking about me and my brother's civics class because an eight-year-old was doing business. Whatever's in you, God lets you practice. That's why you gotta watch your kids because their, their, their prophecies and their habits and their details and the little stuff they do and the little things that sometimes get on your nerves, they're little glimpses of what's gonna be in their life. You don't become Michael Irvin when you join the Cowboys. You become Michael Irvin when you're backed up in the Carolina somewhere where nobody knows your name and nobody cares about your name and nobody's thinking about you. It is not about what they think about your name. It is about your diligence in going after what God has for you. I got to move on. I, and so he says, go down there and tell Pharaoh. I said, let my people go. Well, Moses has the power to walk into Pharaoh's house because he was raised in Pharaoh's house. So he walks up in Pharaoh's house and said, God said, let my people go. And Pharaoh thinks he's a God. Because in his life, he is a God. 
He serves a God, a deity, but he has so much power, he's drunk off of himself. If you're not careful, success will make you drunk off of yourself. And nobody can tell you that you're not a God, and nobody can tell the king that he has no clothes, because if everybody you surround, your with, you surround yourself with is on your payroll, you can't be sure you're getting the truth. I don't know who that's for, but it's for somebody. So let me show you the scripture right quick, because I got to make some. I got to make some ground. <laughs> Are y'all enjoying this? So I'm going to Exodus 7, 8 through 12. I want you to see what happened in the palace. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, That's when you're going to find out why you've been practicing out in the desert. When I put you on stage, that's when I'm going to activate the things you've been rehearsing. Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and it became, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Pay attention to that. The rod became a serpent. That's going to have power all through the Bible. The rod became a serpent. This is not just a moment. This is a glimpse. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Pharaoh said, I ain't nothing. I can do that too. So he called his wise men, his magicians, his sorcerers, and now the magicians of Egypt. They did, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. That's why you got to be careful of Christians who follow miracles. Because Satan does tricks too. Somebody in here's mama's name is Helen. Somebody in here, you dropped out of school in the seventh grade. You got to be careful about following people over this fanatical kind of stuff. You got to be rooted on a solid foundation, on the word of God, on the truth, on the spirit of God, on the presence of God, and not on what you see with your eye. Because Pharaoh said, that ain't nothing. Them tricks you've been practicing, we do that too. So Pharaoh called for his magicians, and they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Do you hear? Do you hear that? Do you hear that? They had more serpents. Aaron only had one rod that became a serpent, but it was stronger than all of the serpents put together, and it ate up his rods. And look at this. I want to spend a minute talking about sticks and snakes. Sticks and snakes, sticks and snakes. This is powerful. We often overlook the relationship between the stick and the snake. The stick became a snake. It was a stick in his hand, but when he cast it down, it became a snake. Sticks and snakes. When Paul was on his way to Rome, the Bible said that while he was gathering sticks, that a snake came out. There's something down between the stick and the snake. 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 Thy rod comforteth me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There's something between the stick and the snake. There makes no accident that the snake was a stick. And the one that was a stick and became a snake devoured all the snakes of the magicians. This is Calvary. You don't see it yet. The Bible said that Christ carried a cross up the hill. That's the stick. And, and he carries it up the, uh, up the hill. That's the stick. But when he got on the stick, he became a snake for us. Uh, the Bible, let me put it in biblical language, he became sin who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God. And by him becoming that, but when he lifted up, he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, if you cast me out, I'll turn into the cure for the venom that, you, that bit you in the first place. So it was snake to snake. 
and Satan said, I hexed, I cast spell, I sent curses. But when Jesus went to the cross, the Bible said he bore every curse that was ever against us, every hex, every spell that was ever against us. That was that one snake eating up all them other snakes. He devoured every last one of them. This is the first glimpse that we see between the stick and the snake. Jesus could have died on the whipping post, but it wouldn't have exemplified the stick and the snake. They could have beat him to death. They could have thrust him through with a sword, but in order to fulfill the drawing out that Moses was going to do and to establish the New Testament church, there had to be an association between the stick and the snake. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus didn't just die as the Lamb of God. He became sin for us. He became, he became the cure from the venom of sin that the first man, Adam, partook of. He is the stick that became a snake. He became sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God. So I don't care who hexed you. I don't care who got a piece of your hair. I don't care who worked roots on you. I don't care what they said about you. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper because God said, I'll eat it up. I'll eat up what they said about you. I'll eat up what they did to you. I'll eat up the spell they cast on your mama. I'll eat up every generational curse. You're going to be the first one of your generation that's going to break the curse. God said, I'm going to eat it up. It got your mama. It got your auntie. It got your uncle. It got your grandfather. It got your great uncle, but it's not going to get you. Everybody who's breaking a generational curse, give him 30 seconds of crazy. Ow! You're watching on TV, type it on the line. Eat it up, Jesus. Eat it up, Jesus. Eat it up, Jesus. They meant it for evil, but eat it up, Jesus. Eat it up, eat it up, eat it up, eat it up. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes, 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 yes. One snake ate up all the snakes of all the magicians and all the curses and all the spells. I got to get off it, but slap your neighbor and say one. <laughs> You only need one, just one, just one, just one, just one, just one, just one. If you got one rod, it's more than all the rods that have been beating you down. If you got one snake, it'll eat up every snake that came up against you. If you got one praise, it'll break a yoke that come against your life. That's why the Bible said, bring ye all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse, that there might be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith. If I will not open up the windows or the floodgates of heaven, heaven and pour you out. Watch this. One blessing. You won't have room enough to receive. God said, I'm going to give you one thing that's going to fix everything that messed up anything that was happening in your life. You only need one thing. You know, one thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after. You better get up off me. I feel something on me. I feel something on me. You better get up. You've been asking for too much stuff. You just need one thing. You just need to be one with God. You need to be one in his presence, one in his glory. Put away your list of stuff. And by 22, I want this. And when I'm 31, I want this. And I want to buy my home when I'm 17. Shut up! Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Stop somebody and tell them I don't need but one thing. I love you, but I don't have to have you. I like you, but I don't have to have you. I want you to be impressed. I want you to appreciate me. But if I never win your appreciation, I only got to have one thing.
God said, I'm going to show you who's God. I'm going to show you who's boss. I'm going to show you who's in charge. I'm going to use stuff that you ain't got. I'm going to whip you without a chariot. I'm going to beat you without a horse. I won't even use a sword to take you down. I'm going to kill you with locusts. God said, I'll use stuff that's not up under your regime and not in your power. I'll turn your water into blood. God said, I'll release frogs. I'll send frogs up out of the rivers of Egypt until you can't see the ground for the frog. God said, I'll send lice after you. I'll send the livestock. We'll all get sick. I'll put boils all over your body. I'll send hell down on top of you. I'll send locusts and darkness and the killing of the firstborn. I'll kill every baby coming out of your womb into your terminal. When God gets ready to bring you out, he'll send stuff you thought couldn't be done to get you out of the body. Look at how much God paid for to get you out of what some of your kinfolks are still into. But God reached down and snatched you out and to God be the glory for the things he has done. He brought you from a mighty long way. How dare you sit there with your lips glued together and act like you can't pray Praise God. Girl, you know you wasn't born like this. God just brought you out. That's why it's dangerous to be an enemy against somebody that God wants to use. It's not that they're dangerous, God is dangerous. God don't take no mess. God will kill you with stuff that they ain't got no name for. You'll be in the hospital and we say, they'll say, we can't figure out what's wrong with you. We did an MRI, we did an EKG, we did an X-ray. We don't have no kind of machine to determine why you died. You'll just be dying. God said, touch not mine anointed. Do my prophets no harm. When I send a man, shut up. You might not agree with him, but shut up. <laughs> Pharaoh in all of his might had no response to fight lice. He knew how to fight armies but not boils. He knew how to fight people, but not locusts. God will hit you where your weapons don't work. All of this to let my people go. Can I take you deeper? Now, this is what I want you to get. Sit down. This is what I want you to get. This is what I want you to get. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost in you. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's not good for me to preach with a mic because it, it pushes me. <laughs> when I get a mic in my hand, I go, you know, I'm trying to be professorial. And this mic, it mess me up. Make me think I'm in a storefront somewhere. Next thing you know, I'll be running down the aisle, walking across pews, leaping up and down in the air, talking in tongues, shaking, shaking devils and rebuking witches and casting out. Because I always keep my stuff with me. I always, I'm always packing. I'm never by myself. I'm always, I always got something, to, just a little extra in case you come at me at the Dairy Queen. I don't need to call nobody to pray for me. I got enough power inside of myself. Don't get it twisted. I was preaching when you got here. Ain't no such thing as a bad crowd if you got a real anointing. I'll flip this place over in the floor if God be for you. Who am I preaching? 
preaching to today. Now, I got to get you where God wants me to get you. Watch this. I don't know who it is, but something just broke in your life. And you can't hardly hold your peace because you, you just got a breakthrough and hell can't do nothing about it. So sit down, sit down, sit down. I wanted you to get that anointing out of you so you can think. Because there is a glory that gets so high you can't think. When the glory is real high, the priest can't minister. The Bible said when the glory fell on Solomon's temple, the priest lay prostrate in the floor because there is a glory that gets you so intoxicated. You got to get that out. Look at the devil and say, whew. 
I had to get that out. Moses is leading them forward almost against their will because while he's trying to get them out from under Pharaoh when they heard Pharaoh's army coming up behind them their emotions took over their intelligence have you ever had your emotions take over your intelligence so out of their emotions affecting their intelligence their reasoning is so flawed that they start arguing over where they're going to die. Were there no graves in Egypt? Why did you bring us into the wilderness to die? This whole conversation is stupid. Real bad. It's like saying, I don't want to die in the bedroom, I want to die in the living room. Why did you bring me in the living room? I wanted to die in the middle. Dead don't make no difference. It doesn't make any difference at all. You don't get in the presence of God and talk stupid. God is intelligent. Moses immediately, they didn't say nothing about being afraid. They just gave a stupid conversation and Moses said, be not afraid. Do we attack people that we ought to discern? Are we so focused on what they say that we don't think about why they said it? Moses doesn't wrestle with the what because the what was ignorant. He goes right to the why. He says, don't be afraid. See, they're dealing with somebody they had seen commit atrocities, bury people alive, split them in two. Of course they were scared. They had not seen God's hand for 400 years. He had worked around them, but he had not worked in them. The difference. He said, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. So the word we call tabernacle in the Hebrew is ohel moed. Yes, it is a tent of meeting. See, sir? God said, I'm taking them on a date. so they can find out who their husband is. Everything else I did for them, the locusts, the lice, the boils, the water turning into blood, the afflictions attacking the animals, all the 10 of the plagues I did for them. But having God doing things for you is different from having God doing things in you. Now, here's where you're at. They have come down to the Red Sea and they think they're going to die. And Moses says, shut up. I'm paraphrasing. I like shut up. I was raised off of shut up, y'all tell, can't you? My mother did not negotiate. <laughs> if you, when as soon as you finish talking, I, I would like to interject a thought. 
He said, shut your mouth, you sound stupid. <laughs> and you know what I did? So what Moses is saying to them is shut up. See, we don't have the kind of faith today that can take an insult. No, no. You will leave the church because somebody sat in your chair. You can't take a good shut up. That's why Pharaoh keeps eating you up. Because until you can endure correction, you're not a son. I don't care what your DNA says. He says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For the Egyptians that you see today, you shall see them no more. He didn't say they wouldn't have to fight again. They had to fight all kinds of people. The Philistines, the Malachites, all kinds of people. God Owen promised I am a nice hit tight Jebusite. But what you worried about, you ain't gonna never see them no more. So settle this in your mind. I will not say this in a provocative way because it is too profound to be provocative. And because I want both your spirit and your soul to hear this, settle this in your mind. In spite of the hoof prints that you hear through your senses coming up behind you and the snorting of the horse's hot breath and the images that have been in your head for 400 years of what Pharaoh can do to you, and now he is after you. It's like the image I had when I went down to the power company years ago and asked them to keep the power on. And the woman said she was gonna cut it off anyway. And I walked out of Appalachian Power Company crying walking down the street because I saw an image of me pushing a go-kart. And me and my wife and my two kids was gonna be homeless. And sometimes it's an image you're fighting. I was crying and I couldn't stop. I was crying over an image. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the... the there, there are, death has shadows. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Any, anybody ever been up all night over an image? It hadn't even happened yet, but it's an image. Anybody in Elijah running from a threat from a Jezebel that you ain't even seen who said you would be dead in 24 hours and the 24 hours has elapsed and you still running? Anybody still running from a ghost, something, bad, something somebody said about you in the first grade, something your stepmother told you, something somebody said about you, something your big sister said about you, and you still running from it? This is why I want to speak to your spirit and to your soul. And this is why you're logged on to this broadcast right now. And this is why you cannot move because the Holy Ghost said, you will not die here. Wait a minute, hold the music. I want you to take that and make it yours. And I want you to hear your voice say, I will not die here. I will. I will not die here. I may die somewhere, but I will not die here. This won't kill me. It may hurt me, but it won't kill me. I will not. Look at somebody and say, I will not. You ain't got enough fight in you. You ain't got enough. I want you to pull up that stuff you did when you found out your husband had a girlfriend. And I want you to say it like you mean it. I will not die here.
And I'm going to show you this and I'm going to close. They couldn't die at the Red Sea because they had a rendezvous scheduled with God. And God could not allow the Red Sea to restrict the meeting. He says, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. The Lord said to me, stop worrying about reconciliation in between races. Stop worrying about that. Stop worrying about that. Stop worrying about that. Stop worrying about reconciliation between generations. Stop worrying about reconciliation between genders. You will never be able to negotiate reconciliation in any of these areas. I said, Lord, I had all kind of reconciliation conferences. I did all kinds of stuff. I counseled couples for years. I did it. He said, you'll never be able to reconcile it. He said, the problem in the reconciliation is not between people or genders or generations. The problem is reconciliation with me. If you reconcile the man and the woman, the young and the old, the black and the white, if they get reconciled with me, then reconciliation with each other is, is not only possible, it is a necessity because I am only one God. There's not a white God and a brown God and a black God and a female God and a male God and a young God and an old God. There's just one God. And if you're going to get to me, you got to brush up against each other. Call them back to me. Call them back to me. Blonde hair, brunette hair, black hair, kinky hair, bald head, no hair, buck teeth, big lips. Call them back! Call them from Australia. Call them from Africa. Call them from Switzerland. Call them from New Zealand. Call them from Puerto Rico. Call them from Mexico. Call them from Canada. God said, call them back! Call the dope dealer, call the deacon, call the whoremonger, call the prostitute, call the church mother, call the senator, call him back! Because if you call them back to me, they will bump into each other, crawling after me. Watch this. Your marriage would get better if both of y'all really got saved. What's wrong with your kids is not that they don't obey you, it's that they don't obey God. What's wrong with you is that you don't obey God. So how you gonna get them to obey God while they watch you not obey God? Oh, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. Sit right there. Sit right there. I'm coming for you. So in order to give you access to him, he parted the Red Sea because the Red Sea was standing in between the people getting to him. He could have killed Pharaoh and his army with a heart attack. All the horses could have dropped dead. He opened up a way. You remember that song? They, he laid the foundation and opened up the way. What more could he do? And they, they don't know what we're talking about, but we know what we're talking about. If you are our age, you know what more could he do? What more could he do? He laid the foundation, opened up the way. What more could he do? What more could he do? What more could he do? Touch, he laid the foundation, opened up the way. What more could he do? That's the way we used to say, y'all don't understand that. That's okay. That's okay. Y'all sing that other stuff. That's good. That's good. But when we got ready to chase a demon out of room, what 
what more could he do? So what he do? He laid the foundation and opened up the way and dropped them across on dry ground. I ain't through yet. And Pharaoh tried to follow him. Nobody can follow you through a way that God made for you. What God has for you is for you and all of your imitators and spectators and haters that's trying to get through the door that God opened up for you, every last one of them going to drown trying to be like you. They can wear your clothes, they can go to your barber, they can wear your tie, but they can't get through your way. When God has a way for you to go through, it's your way. And once you get through, he's going to shut it down. Watch this. He shut it down. And here's the question. And here's the problem. They were trying to get away from Pharaoh more than they were trying to get to God. At what point do we stop running from and start running to? There will was or is currently a time in your life that you gave your all, stepped out on faith, forsook the f familiar, offered up the right sacrifices and didn't see the reward you anticipated. The job that downsized, the marriage that failed, the child that died, the business that capsized, the church that just won't grow. No matter how successful we may be in many years, we are never exempt from the reflective, reminiscent idea, what was that all about? See, this is what started me with this text. See, they said, were there no graves in Egypt? Why did you bring us out into the wilderness to die? What started me with the whole text was, they did die in the wilderness. The question wasn't wrong. They didn't die at the Red Sea, but they did die in the wilderness. Wonder why God delivers us in one place and lets us die in another. That's one question. Second question is, what about me needs to die for me to get to the promised land? Sometimes God puts you in the wilderness to kill the thing that's stopping you from getting to the promised land. New Testament reflection on it is the first generation died in the wilderness not having faith mixed with the word that they heard. They died in the wilderness because their motives were wrong. They were running from, not to. So God raises up another generation in the wilderness who has no Pharaoh to run from. Because what God wants from us, help me, Jesus. Bless. What God wants from us and what God has challenged me to do is to create thirst in this room for him. 
I'm glad you go to this church. I'm glad you come out here. I'm glad you come out here when it's hot and when it's raining, when it's cold. I'm glad. I'm glad you're streaming online. I'm glad we got, normally, I don't know what the numbers are today, but somewhere between 70 and 80,000 people watching right now on stream all over the world. I'm so glad. Stay tuned. Glad to have you. Good for you to be here. Welcome to the Potter's House. That's wonderful. But why are you watching? If you are just running from Pharaoh, God will kill your Pharaoh to check your motive. And once Pharaoh was dead, they wandered for 40 years because their motive was still running from, and they did not ever transition to running to. And they were so busy running from whatever horror that brought you to church, whatever nightmare, whatever atrocity, whatever abuse, whatever misfortune, whatever agony, whatever crisis that brought you to church, thank God. God used it to bring you here but you can't spend your entire life running from a shadow. What God wants for this church is for us to bring you into an encounter. You can't even have a relationship until you have an encounter with God. Then you can have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with somebody that you don't have an encounter with and you're having an encounter with church and music and singing and dancing and preaching and hooping and hollering and jumping and information and intellect and education and all that's good and all that's wonderful and we don't have to stop none of that but none of that means a hill of beans none of your degrees none of your education none of your hooping none of your changing keys none of your riffs none of your runs mean nothing it don't mean nothing Beyonce can riff, Aretha can riff, Michael Jackson can riff. I don't care about your riffing. If it doesn't bring me into an encounter with God, you're wasting your breath. You can teach me Hebrew, you can teach me Greek, you can teach me Swahili, but if you don't bring me to Jesus, why am I here? God says, I don't want them to have an encounter with you. I don't want them to have an encounter with the band. I don't want them to have an encounter with the praise team or the praise dancers. I don't just want them to have an encounter with your education, your intellect, your ability, or your decisiveness, or your, your, your revelations, or none of that, if it does not bring them into an encounter with me. I'm the one who sent the balls and the lice and the frogs to bring your Pharaoh and make him turn you loose. I'm the one who laid the foundation and opened up a way and made it possible for you to get out of jail, for you to escape your turmoil, for your body to be healed, for you to survive breast cancer. I'm the one that brought you through the flood and the fire and the food stamps and the crisis and the trauma in your life. I'm the one that brought you from crack and cocaine and drugs and addiction. I'm the one! And I am a jealous God. I'm jealous that I brought you out and you fall in love with other people. I'm jealous that I spent all my resources to deliver you and you still don't put me above everybody else. I'm jealous that I still play suck and fiddle around your force, your false idols and your fake gods. And I want you to miss me. I want you to miss me, not deacon you, not elder you, not evangelist you, not bishop you. I want you, Freddie. 
on your knees crawling to this altar begging me for my presence and my glory and my anointing and I will meet you in your wilderness and I will meet you in your despair and I will meet you in your agony and I will meet you in your loneliness and I will meet you in your pain and I will meet you in your confusion when you stop entertaining and start begging me for me. It's not enough that you escape Pharaoh if you don't find me. Pharaoh's dead and you're still not happy. You came, you came here to find me. Yeah. You came here to seek me. You came here to lay on your face in my presence and hunger for me. And all you worried about is your seat and your parking space. And the fact that you're more worried about your pocket space than you are my glory is a sign that you only have an encounter with church and you've never had an encounter with God. You don't mind being late. You don't mind leaving early. You don't mind because you're more worried about the pancake house than you are the glory of God. And nobody can pastor you and nobody can lead you and nobody can help you because you're better at coming to work than you are at coming to me. You're more long-suffering with your lying husband than you are to me. And I want to see you humble yourself in my presence and miss me and crave me and I want you to have an encounter with me that changes the rest of your life, that changes your trajectory, that leaks into your daughter and your son, that heals your body and heals your mind. I want you to have an encounter with me and you would need less therapy if you had more power. I want you to have an encounter with me until you can sleep at night. I want you to have an encounter with me until I fill up the emptiness that nobody can be able to fill. Not your husband and your boyfriend. None of them can feel the place. I left a hold in you. I left a thirst in you. I left a craving in you. And I want you to want me. And the reason you will not die here is that I kept you alive in the hopes that somewhere in the wilderness you would stop running from and start running to. And I want you to know that I am more than religion, that I am more than a building, that I am more than theology and doctrine and ideas and Bible discussions and debates about text and what does this mean and what does that mean. I am your God. I am your God and I brought you through hell and I brought you through high water. And I brought you through agony and I brought you through stuff you thought you wouldn't get through. And I'm tired of you not talking to me. And I'm tired of you not craving me. And I'm tired of you not longing for me. I gave you the wealth of the Egyptians. Not so you could show off. I just wanted to show you how good I could be to you. If you ever miss me. And no, I'm not going to make no formal altar call because if I have to make an altar call, you didn't hear me. If I have to call you, you didn't even hear nothing that I said today. If there's nothing in your belly that's calling you, stay in your seat. I only want people who feel a magnetism, a drawing, a pulling, a craving, a nagging, a missing, a hunger, a thirst, a, a wailing in their soul that says, God, I want an encounter with you. And I don't care if I have to come on Sunday and come on Wednesday. And I don't care if I got to lay on my face. I need something real. I need something something that will last. I need something I can take home with me. I can't take this band with me. I can't take them good singers with me. I can't take the bishop with me. I can only take you with me. And I need something that goes with me when I'm going through hell on my job and I want to quit and cuss everybody out. I need something in my belly that sustains me.